Good morning. We welcome you and ask you to join us in worship as we believe God joined us in the worship gathering. This service is a direct broadcast from our sanctuary at Trinity Lutheran Church, 534 Street Northwest in Fairwell, Minnesota. Our pastor, the Reverend Paul Weir, will be conducting the service and delivering the sermon entitled Not Here for a Good Time. <clears throat> our organist will be Nancy Simonson. Order of Worship will be Divine Service 1 on page 151 of the Lutheran Service Book. Please join the congregation for the opening hymn, Lord, Keep Us Steadfast in Your Word, number 655 in the Lutheran Service Book. Please rise and join me on page two of our worship folder, where we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. With that truth in mind, let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins, and therefore as a called and ordained servant of my Lord Jesus Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord 
for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord be with you. Thank you. Please join me on page five and together let us pray the collect of the day. Merciful Lord, we give you thanks for your church on earth. We pray that you will continue to guide and protect it always through your word. Give us grace to remain faithful to you and to the salvation you promise us through Jesus Christ. It is in his name we pray. Amen. And as we begin to reflect on God's word, we begin by chanting verses from Psalm 119. My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, yet I have not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your law. All your commandments are sure. They persecute me with falsehood. Help me. They have almost made an end of me on earth. But I have not forsaken your precepts. In your steadfast love give me life, that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading comes to us this morning from Jeremiah chapter 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? Or who has paid attention to his word and listened? 
Behold, the storm of the Lord. The wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart, who think to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, even as their fathers forgot my name for Baal? Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream. But let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then our second reading comes from Hebrews 11 and 12. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his own son, of whom it was said, Though through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the, end of, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover, by sprinkling the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as if on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Then we continue with our scripture hymn, the first three verses of Thy Strong Word.
And now I invite you to rise for the reading of our Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke from the 12th chapter. Jesus said, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky. But why do you not know how to interpret the present time? This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated, and I invite the children to come forward for our children's message. All right, come on up. Oh, lots of kids today. This is great. And Sarah and Gabriella, awesome. So glad you're here. I have a funny book here. And I, I can't figure out what's the front. Because I look at it this way, you know, and there's a cross on it, right? And I can open it up and there's pages in it. But if I flip it around the other way, it's still a book and it has a cross on it and you open up the pages. I'm confused. Like, if I wanted to write a note in here, what side do I start with? you know? Me neither. I'm just really, really, it's weird. It's a weird book, but does it remind you of a book you know? Yeah, what book do you know that might look like that? The Bible Bible looks like that. You know, sometimes the Bible is kind of confusing because sometimes it says things that are like really hard, like when Jesus said there's going to be fire that comes down and that he's going to do, you know, things, you know, against people who are sinners. And then there's the other part where he says how much he loves you. And so the Bible sometimes can be really confusing. And Pastor's going to talk about that a little bit today. So this kind of reminds me of when we're dark in sin. The white cross reminds us of the hope that we have of forgiveness and being able to go to heaven, right? Yeah, but the Bible also tells us that when things are going great, like everything's white and everything's great and it's joyful and happy, that oh, the cross is there for a reason because sometimes we sin and we forget about our sins. And yeah, and God reminds us that I came for a reason to forgive you of those sins. So today is a little weird day, a little confusion between what the Bible tells us. But in it all, we know that God loves us. And like we learned in Vacation Bible School, God is always good, right? Yeah. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word that sometimes is hard. And your word that sometimes is loving. We thank you for both because we know in both that you are good. And we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I think there's candy right back there. Thank you for coming up. As the children grab some candy after the children's lesson, Nancy will make her way back to the organ and we will continue with the second half of Thy Strong Word.
please be seated. And grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Some very challenging lessons for us today from Scripture. They challenge especially our perceptions of who God is. One of the most interesting books I've ever read is a book called American Jesus, which I had to read for uh, an independent study I did on how Jesus has been represented in movies. The book was all about how Jesus has been portrayed throughout American history, that he's this soft and gentle mama's boy on one side, and then on the other side he's a man's man. He's someone who could take down anything. He can do anything. So then the question as we reflect on all of this is how are we viewing Jesus today? The problem is, is that we will mold and shape and adapt Jesus however we want him to look. He's a white man, he's a black man, but the truth is, is he's from the Middle East. He's for gay rights, he's against gay rights, but the reality is, is that he was deeply loving but also called people out on their sins. Jesus is pro-gun. Jesus is anti-violence. But yet what we see of Jesus in Scripture is that he is a loving teacher who at times flipped tables when it was necessary. So the question is, who's Jesus? In our reading today, he's not who we normally picture him to be. We think of him as a a peaceful and loving man, but here there is fire in his voice. He is using this passionate, vivid language to display how he feels. You know, we kind of have this picture of Jesus as a sort of like an Eastern monk who sits and patiently meditates. But the reality is, is that Jesus is God who has taken on human flesh to love and serve his creation. And he shows passionately his love today. He shows that in full force as he speaks to the people. But it's helpful, especially with these challenging readings, that we get some context first. And so beginning with Luke chapter 12, we see Jesus is surrounded by a crowd, surrounded by some Pharisees and surrounded by his disciples. Luke specifically mentions that this crowd is huge. There are many thousands of people, and these many thousands of people are trampling over each other to see Jesus. Trampling's not loving language. It's violent language. People are getting hurt to come and see this Jesus. The news about him is traveling far and wide. And so Jesus takes this opportunity to reach out and teach these people He says, at first, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Jesus, first and foremost, is calling out the religious leaders who many people look up to for the examples of how to to live and how to worship. But Jesus here is also setting up our lesson today and is really speaking more to the crowds than just to the Pharisees. Because there are plenty of hypocrites in this crowd, too. Thousands of people who are gathered just to see Jesus because he's a popular or infamous figure, not because of the great changes and the great healing that he's bringing to this world. Jesus continues in this speech to these people, warning about spiritual death, saying, do not fear those who can kill the body. Fear those who can kill the soul. Moves on to let people know that whoever acknowledges Jesus before the world will themselves be acknowledged before God, and vice versa, whoever denies him will be denied. Jesus then teaches about money and anxiety, teaching the people to place their trust solely in God and heaven, who is in control of all things. And finally, he warns them to be ready for God, who will come without notice. But then Jesus launches into our reading today with one of the most difficult things for us to hear. He says, I have come to cast fire, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is, comp- is, it, until it is accomplished. This is not the normal, peaceful, loving language that we're used to hearing from Jesus. At least in our minds, this is not who we know Jesus to be. This is violent language. Fire on the earth. 
But as we consider this language, as we consider this teaching that he is bringing, let us consider where Jesus' focus is. His focus is not on the crowds, even though his love is sincerely there for them, else he wouldn't be teaching them. Jesus' eyes are fixed upon the cross. They are fixed upon what must be accomplished on the cross. The fire cast down on the earth, this other baptism, other than the one he already experienced in the Jordan, these things that he must go through and he must experience will happen for the, de- for the, for the forgiveness and salvation of all people as he experiences death and resurrection. But before that death comes the fiery wrath of God, which is poured out solely upon Jesus so that we would not suffer for our sins. He willingly goes to the cross so that we would not suffer that wrath. And this baptism he goes through is not one of water, but one of the grave. His beaten, limp, lifeless body is taken down from the cross and placed in the tomb. But baptism is not just a burial, but more importantly, a rising. And our Easter joy is that Jesus rises from death to life. And it is with this death and resurrection that Jesus brings salvation, and he also brings division. Because the reality is, is that the ruler of many hearts in this world, including our own, is the evil of sin. And let's not deny the fact that we love being in our sin. We love it so much that we will adapt anything and everything to get permission to sin, to feel guiltless, to feel unashamed, even changing Scripture, even changing our God. Because the problem is is that we're seeking to be justified before mankind. This is not a new problem. That's all that was happening in that reading from Jeremiah. As these prophets who are prophesying these foolish and, and other things that are just simply false because they are trying to seek approval of mankind. But Jesus, our great example, is not here to please people. He is not here for a good time. He is here to bring the truth and to bring glory to God. And in doing so, he is going to bring division. We cringe at hearing this language because it's so opposite of the picture of Jesus that we have in our minds. But by his very nature, Jesus and his entrance into this world is dividing and offensive. He's not here to make people smile or feel good. He's here to break us, to break us away from sin, to break us of these habits and these temptations that continually pull us into darkness. And he's even here to peel us away from that darkness. It is a purifying fire that he wishes to bring, to remove these impurities from us and leave us shining as pure gold. And that's an offensive thing. The the forgiveness of God is there and it's ready and it's available for all people to forgive them for all sins. And that is hard for us to deal with. Because forgiveness is there for sins, including things like pedophilia, murder, rape. Anything that we might consider disgusting and unforgivable, God forgives. We think that they deserve to burn in hell, as many people have said about people who suffer from those sins. But God does not. God does not desire the death of the sinner. God desires to take their place, to remove their sins, to remove this this awful thing from them, to leave them pure and holy and new, to make them his children. But yet, because of this offensiveness, because of this, how difficult this gospel is, families will be divided. Some of you might have even experienced this in your own families. Your, your child calls you a fool for believing. Your spouse thinks that you're just wasting your time by going to, to church. 
constantly the church is ridiculed for the faith. But Jesus, Jesus' work, Jesus' church, this church that we belong to, all of these things are not here to make people happy. We are here to change lives, to make people new, to give them the gospel, to bring them to their God who wants them to be perfect, and most importantly, to bring people from sin to life. Because what is happening is the world is passing away. We see our world groaning in pain. We see the destruction. We see sin just having its way with our world. And God hates that. And we as God's people hate that. God hates that sin has ruined his precious world and that sin has ruined his precious people. And thus, firstly, he gives us Christ to make us new. But secondly, there is an ultimate final day coming when all things will pass away. But yet, it is important for us who confess our hope in Christ to know that it is not in God's wrath that this day comes, but in God's liberation. He will come with great power to call the dead to rise to life, so that all the living will be gathered together before him and all will live together with him. It is a time where sin is gone, where death is no more, where the tears are dried up. This is our hope. This is our expectation. But we must always remember that these things have not, do not, and will not come easy. It is through strife and tribulation that these things will come. But take heart and do not fear, brothers and sisters, because you know of the love of God, how God dearly loves you, how he has taken your place in death and given you life, how he has forgiven you all of your sins, how he constantly forgives you all of your sins, even even when you constantly fail. You have a God who knows you by name, who knows every hair on your head, who knows your joys, who knows your sorrows. And even in this division that God has brought, it is to bring salvation to the world. It is for your benefit, and it is for your life eternal. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, as you see there in your worship folder, we're going to continue our worship by gathering our tithes, offerings, and other gifts to the Lord. I encourage you to bring those as you're able. I also encourage you to uh, fill out that little red friendship pad at the ends of your pews.
We now continue on page 8 by confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please rise. The Apostles' Creed is printed on the screens and in the back cover of your hymnal. Let us confess the ancient Christian faith using these words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And please remain standing as we go before our God in prayer. Let us pray. And so, dear Lord, we again come before you in prayer. As we have reflected on these challenging words from Jesus this morning, Lord, we pray that you would bless us to trust in you, to trust in your work for us, that even though these things that you bring to our creation divide us and divide even our own families, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to put our faith solely in you, knowing that your love is great, that it went to the cross for us, that it suffered and died for us, that it rose to give us life, and that it is coming to bring us to perfection. Help us to trust in all of these things. Lord, in your mercy. We also lift up, Lord, our loved ones to you, praying especially for Kurt, Gary, Bill and Judy, Verna Ball, Mandy Bloom, Lisa David, Dennis Krentz, Jenny Moore, Barb Roach, Nancy Schultz, Esther Seapolt, Donald G. Steppen, and Dennis Wiskoski, and all those other names that we carry in our hearts and lift up to you now. We also pray for those in nursing homes, especially the lonely and the neglected. We pray for those in our military and their support personnel that you would bless them as they serve. We pray for our nation, asking, Lord, that you would grant us peace, healing, and unity. We lift up our leadership and ask that you would grant them wisdom as they serve us. We pray for the families of our church. We pray, Lord, that you would bless our efforts to support them, especially this morning as we gather together in a, another sharing event. We pray, Lord, for those who are pregnant, unborn, young, and old. We ask, Lord, that you help us always to love and serve life. And then we lift up schools as people gather together to uh, get ready to go back to school, that you bless all families, but that you would especially bless our school, Faribault Lutheran School, and the staff, the students, and their families. Lord, in your mercy, we continue to pray for the family and friends of Deb Reck, the, uh, the uh, stepdaughter of Murtis Reck, who passed away recently, whose life we celebrated this past Friday. We lift up these people who mourn, especially Murtis, asking, Lord, that you would bring them great comfort and care. But then also, Lord, we pray that you would help us as the church to surround these people with love and support, but especially with that truth of the gospel that death has been defeated and that the, their loved ones will rise again. Lord, in your mercy. And then we lift up missionaries serving all over the world, praying that you bless them with your Holy Spirit, Lord but especially lifting up Micah and Robin and their children as they serve in Togo. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, we pray for us here at Trinity. We pray for our office project. We thank you for the generous people who raised money, the work that's been accomplished so far. We pray, Lord, that you continue to bless this project, especially that you would bless it to be constructed to your glory and for your kingdom work. And then we pray for our senior pastor, who you will bless us soon with. We know and trust in you, Lord, that you will bless us with someone. And we pray for this upcoming voters meeting and uh, the two candidates that we have, that you would place the right man here to serve us and lead us. And then finally, we pray for our family here. Especially this week, we lift up Marcy Matthies, Ruby Meyerbachtel, 
Barb Meinsma, Vernon Becca Meinsma, and Abby, and Carla Meyer with Audrey. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, as we pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And then, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated as we close in song with Jesus Loves Me. We now continue with our matters of importance, and first up is Nancy Simonson, who is going to tell you about VBS. VBS was great. God is good. That was our theme of the week. No matter what happens in life, whether things are scary or unfair or sad, God is always good, and he definitely was good at our vacation Bible school. We had 84 students attend. God is good. 52 of those were non-members. That means 60% of them were not from here. God is good. We had 60 plus helpers, teachers, leaders, set builders, all kinds of people that helped us on that week. God is good. And out of those members, out of those 60 people, 10 of them were non-members. Out of that 60, 15 were middle schoolers, people from junior high age that were helping us out. God is good. We tried a supper, and we had 50, 40 to 60 people attend that supper, and we had a family that donated pizza. God is good. Mm -hmm. And we have to thank our um, congregation here in Faribault, our saviors, who loaned us some of the items that we had up here on the set. They loaned us the Jeep and the part of the giraffe and some other items for us, and that really helped us out. And we're looking forward to having an, a future relationship with them with sharing some supplies like that. So our God is good. We also had plenty of um, monetary donations from you gracious people who emptied my tag board immediately, even before the 8 o'clock service started, and all the other monetary donations that came was awesome because we were able to cover all our costs and have a little bit of seed money for next year. So 
God is good. And I'd like to show you how good God was with us, with our kids at VBS. God is good. The students uh, decided to um, give money to drill a well in the country of Tanzania because they don't have a well there and the kids there have to travel six to eight hours to go to a river or a hole and get water, put it in buckets and carry it back to their home. So we decided that we would donate our money to drill a well in Tanzania. The students brought in $755 and we had a couple of individual contributions that brought it to $1,000. So we were able to send $1,000 to the organization that will be overseeing the drilling of a well in Tanzania. So God is good. Thank you. And thank you, Nancy. As we come to the close of another service, we pray that it has been a blessing to you to strengthen your faith in Christ. This service is a direct broadcast from the Sanctuary of the Trinity Lutheran Church in Fairwell, Minnesota. Our pastor, the Reverend Paul Reeder, conducted the service and delivered the sermon until not, not here for a good time. Our organist was Nancy Simonson. If you like a copy of today's sermon, please write to us at Trinity Radio Club, 53 Northwest 4th Street, Fairwell, Minnesota, 55021. Please be sure to include your name, return, address, and today's date. You can also visit us on the web at www.trinityradioandvideo.org where you can view past services, order copies of past services, and see a calendar events at Trinity Lutheran Church. Until next Sunday at 8 a.m., we return you out to the downtown studios of KDHL. <laughs>